Hi, welcome to Education Matters. Uh, I'm Ray Finney. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have a great conversation on AI or artificial intelligence. Uh, I know it's something that I was kind of afraid of when I first heard about it, uh, and I think a lot of us are there. We don't know it. How can it be used? We're a little unsure of ourselves. So, and I think as board members and administrators, we have to at least look at it because it's still there. So with me is Dr. Peter Hughes. Hi, Peter. Hi, Hi Ray. How are you? He's a superintendent of the Crest Hill School District, and I know you use it a lot, but just tell us a little bit very briefly about the Crest Hill School District. Yeah, we're a great uh, school district, pre-K to 12th grade. Um, we have about 1,700 students up in Bergen County, and this is a tool that I've been using a lot of. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, how did Shillian view AI? You know, is it like a, I kind of look at it as a tool. I think the most important way of viewing it is exactly that. It's a tool. And you can use the tool for positive and you can use the tool for negative. And there's a lot of perceptions around there that may or may not be accurate. It's a tool for education. Just like when the internet came out, um, the internet was initially, there was some pushback on it because people could use Google to look up the answers instead of really critically thinking. And AI is similar. It's something that can be used by our students. And frankly, it's not going away. Um, it came out and it's a new tool to use. And you can either kind of bury your head in the sand and believe that it doesn't exist. You can fight it or you can start to adapt to it. And I think adapting to it is the right move um, in general. That's what I've been working with my teachers and my school district towards. And I think that in general, that's going to lead to a better outcome for our kids because it's really about preparing our kids for the future, not necessarily um, kind of watching out and being safeguards for for dangers that don't exist. Okay, and my example is so it's a hammer. You can it's use a hammer. To build a something beautiful, or you can use it to tear something down. But it is there. So, um, and I'm sure it's being used, even if the district doesn't have a policy on it, which most don't at this moment. Right. They probably soon will. Teachers are probably using it. Students are probably already using it. Uh, administrators are probably using it. So it's it's being used. But what are some positive ways that you think a teacher can use AI? Oh, my gosh. It can create such an ease of flow for teachers. If they need to create a lesson plan and they want to have 10 different ways of doing it, um, they can actually ask through a prompt, you know, create a lesson plan that's going to be highly interactive and and geared towards second graders and aligned to the New Jersey core curriculum and content standards. And make sure that it also um, has a lesson for my student who's visually impaired. Give me ad adaptations for that. Just the ideas around that. And the teacher can type in the prompt and get kind of a lesson plan that's created and then ask it to modify the lesson plans based on the kids in the class. So. It's a way of truly getting to a tool that will help the teacher differentiate in a way that we couldn't before. So I think that it can be really powerful. And that's just one example. It can also come up with 10 different ideas for a way for a student to demonstrate mastery of a skill. Um, so a kid might be able to create a song or, and it will generate the ideas for the teacher. Um, it will also take things that are probably in their traditional lesson planning and give them additional ideas. So AI has a way of really making the, the process of teaching more streamlined and more adapted for kids. Two things on that. Uh, yeah. uh, one, you used the word prompt a lot. I, yeah. I think we might want to explain that to people who are novice to AI. You know, what's a prompt? Because I think that's one of the important things in terms of professional development is learning how to prompt uh, either as a student, as a teacher, as an administrator, what's the prompt and how is it, why is it used? So the way AI works is it basically takes whatever your prompt is and it tries to give you an answer based on kind of all of the information that exists. And the prompt that you ask for, the more specific you are with it, the more likely you are to get, you know, a quality output. You know, garbage in, garbage out, quality in, quality out. So the critical thinking with something like artificial intelligence actually comes from the thought process of how do I create a prompt 
to get the computer to do exactly what I want it to do and give me a product that is more useful. Mm -hmm. So if the teacher is more, um, more experienced with that, Ray, they're able to dem demonstrate like really high quality prompts, um, even in teaching. So for example, you might be working with an ELA class in 11th grade and have ChatGPT come up with a poem um, just about your school, then you can actually say that you want to use the voice of Shakespeare and it will convert that poem into Shakespearean text. Mm -hmm. So that's something a teacher would never have time to do. And a teacher may not have the ability to do that on the fly, but ChatGPT inside of a classroom setting, if you have the right prompts, you can, you can take your teaching to a different level that wouldn't exist otherwise. Uh, before we go on, if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat room in the Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're uh, watching, and uh, we'll pass it on to Peter or myself. Um, I just want to get into the professional development for our staff, because you're kind of talking about it a little mm -hmm. bit now. But I am sure, like the other the general population, the teachers are have different comfort levels with AI. Some of them may be kind of, I don't want to use it at all. I think it's not good teaching. Others might be saying, this is saving me hours. So, uh, right. and maybe giving me a better lesson plan. Right. Um, I think the best way to kind of get professional development to teachers is to meet them where they are, right? You're going to have teachers that are advanced adopters, people who have already started playing with it two years ago. And you're going to have teachers who really want to ignore this technology because it's different than the way that they've taught. The best way to handle that is, first of all, I think most of our people are superintendents and board members that are watching right now. Um, the idea of creating a policy that actually outlines kind of the boundaries of what AI should be in your school districts is really impactful. Um, I think that's top level, like giving permission to the teachers and guidance to them about what you would like to see happen inside of your classrooms. I think that's a great way of helping them. And then you need to do some professional development that helps get them there. And, and I would, if I was going to make a recommendation, say, use your expert teachers that have already been early adopters to show those newer teachers what works already and how much time they're saving. Um, and as an administrator, I spend a lot of time showing staff what they can do to make their lives easier. And I think the second you do that, the second they realize, wow, this actually could streamline my job significantly, there's automatic buy-in at that point. And I, I also think a lot of us don't realize we're using AI now. And oh, we may not time. be thinking, you know, if you're using yep. a GPS system, if, you're, if you have Siri. I mean, those, these are all AI driven. Yeah. So it's there. It's there. Um, right now, I was, I was watching a podcast on my way in about AI and <laughs> they were talking about how you can now ask Alexa to plan a dinner for your your kids five friends two of them need gluten-free food and ask Alexa to also purchase the food and have it delivered to the house so that's the degree where we're going with AI where it's going to be a very integrated tool into all of our lives so the idea that we shouldn't be preparing kids for that is really antiquated. We have to prepare people for a changing society because society is changing based on this technology, just like the internet changed us in the 2000s. Yes, and uh, I'm old enough to remember when the calculator first came out, there was pushback on the calculator. <laughs> right. Because uh, I was one of the first classes to have a calculator and not everyone had one. Uh, but uh, I guess the other thing I, I want to bring on, uh, on that is there's still a human element and you kind of touched on it before when you said, you have to look at the answers that it's providing you after the prompt to kind of manipulate to get, oh, you're like, oh, and that's where the teacher comes and say, this lesson plan doesn't fit my class. So, and we'll get to the, that part with students, but there is a part there that um, is key to say that the human element is really important in this. It's not like they do everything. Right. And I think we've already learned some of the downfalls of AI. Um, it's really good at making stuff up whether or not it's true. And things like, if I ask an AI prompt, 
and ask it to cite resources, cite sources, it may make them up. It's just trying to appease me as the user. It's not necessarily checking for quality. And that's where the teachers and the students all need to have a conversation about the limitations of these technologies because that human element is not going away. The critical thinking is not going away. First of all, you need the critical thinking inside of the prompt when you make it. You need the critical thinking inside of determining whether or not the answer that it's giving is the best one for you. Critical thinking and that collectively um, creative process of learning does not disappear with ChatGPT or the AI tools that we have. We still have to have that human oversight, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so we've kind of talked a little bit about it. You know, we could do this could be a two hour podcast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I want to get into how you can use it as an administrator uh, later and as support. But let's go to the students now. I mm -hmm. think a lot of the fear that I would say that teachers have and even administrators, maybe even parents, is that plagiarism yeah. and things of that sort. I, I do want to I'll backtrack one thing. When you talked about it, it makes things up. I think those are called hallucinations. Yeah, it totally hallucinates. <laughs> and it makes up things. So you have to right. be aware of that. So um, the, so what do you think we should be telling the students how to use AI? Uh, what's the, the boundary between the teacher and the student on that? I think this is a really important discussion to start having as a school district, as a board, as administrators, and as teachers. Um, you need to come to the agreement of what ways you want AI to be used as a tool and what ways you don't want it to be used. And that should be outlined in policy and discussed. And that's where the discussion point should be as we're starting with this new technology. I think that some of the best practices I've seen is when the teachers actually talk to the kids about, hey, this is ChatGPT, this is AI. These are the things you should use it for. These are the things you shouldn't use it for. And I also saw recently um, AI for Educators. It's a book that just came out. They have, have a graphic. And they have six different stages that you can use AI for and things like writing prompts. You can have a conversation and they, they encourage you to do that about which level do you think is appropriate for our classroom and which area do we think is not appropriate. It has to do with setting boundaries. So if I go back to the internet example, when you used Google, you know, teachers will typically say you could use Google for this, but not for that, right? Or you need to cite your sources. Well, I think that ChatGPT or AI, these tools need the same type of transparency and discussion because the kids need to have that conversation about what is and is not appropriate. Um, what they will see is kind of this arms race between people labeling things plagiarism and people not labeling things plagiarism and saying it's the tool and it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question in the chat. Oh, sure. Uh, are there ways to create prompts to avoid hallucinations? I think the best way to do it is to realize what um, what the tool will most likely hallucinate on and maybe provide things like cite the resources inside of the prompt. Give, give the computer, give ChatGPT the resources you want to use in the argument. So, for example, if I find three different primary sources, you can actually list those sites and the quotes that you want incorporated into the writing. And you could do something like that. Now, this is an area where the kids have to do a little bit of work before creating the prompt, but you're going to get a higher quality prompt and you're going to get a prompt that you know has real resources that it's citing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's an area that you can increase and make sure that the things that it's generating are not hallucinations. Yeah. Um, one of the other things, you were talking about it before, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned plagiarism. There are, quote unquote, some things that can uh, detect whether something was written AI or not AI, but my understanding is it's not quite there yet. It's not there yet, and you would have a real hard time demonstrating beyond a shadow of a doubt that something was or was not AI generated. Um, for example, they took Genesis out of the Bible and put it through one of those detectors and it detected that it was generated by AI, <laughs> not 
actually a resource. So these types of things, um, the, from what I understand is the way it works is it will, if, if there's like kid-based literacy, if they are an average student writing, it actually checks to see what percentage of the writing is average because that's more likely to be written by AI than not. That's not a great litmus test. Mm -hmm. It's not a way of saying that kid cheated. So you have to instead pivot from this idea of gotcha and you have to pivot towards this idea that it's a tool. Let's teach them how to use the tool. Let's teach them the appropriate and ethical way of using the tool in our perspective. It's going to be a discussion for a while about what is and is not appropriate for the use of this tool. But I think that ultimately what you'll see happen is this set of agreements that come out that are even more impactful because it actually shows the students right from wrong. It also helps them use it to promote critical thinking rather than avoiding critical thinking and learning. So um, I, I guess I would add that it, this is another part of the human element. The teacher has to know yeah. their students. Yep. And, um, and you can kind of tell when something is, it doesn't sound like your voice. Right. Uh, because we all have a voice when we write. I mean, I know a lot of teachers are using it for writing, I guess, and you kind of went there before, you might want to explain, you can use AI for the first draft or AI yep. for proofing the last draft or whatever, but that's a discussion that the teacher needs to have. And can they say, cite to me where you used AI? I or think that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Cite the prompts, tell me where, how did it help you? How did it not help you? Those are questions that actually deepen the learning mm -hmm. and deepen the critical thinking nature of what the kids are doing. You actually want them answering questions about their learning metacognitively. Like, hey, it's so much more impactful to have that dialogue than to not and then just ignore that tool. I think this is going to prepare kids for a working world in the future, right? Our job is to prepare kids for a future that not yet exists. I know for one certainty, this is going to exist in their lives. It's going to exist in their in their job world, right? So instead of resisting using it as a tool, teaching them reasonable ways to use it to augment their own learning and their own thought process is so much better. It's so much better in my opinion. Okay, we kind of just touched the tip of the iceberg. We talked yeah. about some of the negatives <laughs> that, yeah, you know, yeah. we and teachers need to be aware of that. As a board, though, they probably should have a discussion about how it's going to be used in the classroom. With the administration will make a recommendation, mm -hmm. have some discussion on it, and they just need to support it probably with professional development for the staff, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. I think that that's highly advisable. I think if, if I was talking about kind of a process here, I would say the board and the administration should be looking at policy right now. I know um, organizations maybe like New Jersey School Board, Strauss SMA, are probably working on sample. Yeah, we are policies, but those sample policies will have to be adapted for what you believe in as educators in the local area. I mean, a nice thing about New Jersey is you have local control and you have the local ability to impact your instructional process. One thing I would add, though, is the idea of equity. If you have districts that are not addressing this and not teaching their kids how to use these tools, you're actually working against making them sufficient in the future. So I think the idea is to figure out how to use these tools in a way that best prepares them for their future lives. So that should be the goal of board members and superintendents as they work on these policies. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to switch gears now. Sure. Because you, I know, use it as a superintendent for your duty as a superintendent and with the board business. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of how you uh, use AI and yeah. why you use it. My understanding from talking to people who use it, including teachers, it's a time saver. Yeah. I'll give you a very real example. Um, I, I just started in Creskill oh, a year and a half ago, right? Um, when I first came on, the board had a goal of writing a new mission statement. Well, I've been using AI since it kind of came out. So I, I was comfortable using it in this situation. We had a public board meeting. I said, hey, this is a workshop meeting. I basically created a word cloud where the 
everybody on my board could anonymously put in words that they think are values that Creskill should have in their mission statement. And they did this and, and you have a word cloud that shows up. And then I take that word cloud and I took those prompts, the words, and I put them into ChatGPT. I said, write a mission statement valuing the following. And I had just the words and it organized it. It did the wordsmithing right there in front of all of them. Within five minutes, we had a working initial draft of what a mission statement could be. Then we continued the wordsmith and to talk about it. Well, we think excellence. Excellence was like the biggest word on the My Word Cloud when we did this. Excellence really needs to be the focus of where we're going as a school district. So I just asked ChatGPT, highlight the idea of excellence. Make sure that that's a cornerstone of the mission statement. Within an hour, we had a finished draft of our mission statement within one meeting. So historically, that might have been two or three meetings where you're talking about, you're debating, you're sending things back and forth. Instead, in one hour, we wound up with our mission statement for the district. So that's one example, right? I mean, I've been in those yeah. type of events where it does take a long time yeah. to, and a lot of arguing over <laughs> one or two words. Uh, so I can see how that does yeah. quicken that and save time, which mm -hmm. I think is going to be a uh, something that we'll, we'll see as we discuss this. Any other example? I think you used it as a in a school survey at one point. Oh, I oh that's an excellent point. Yes, I used it in a school survey. What a lot of times you'll do a survey like a Google form, and you'll ask data about you know, for example, professional development plan. You're asking all of your teachers to give you input about professional development. You can take all of their input in all of those cells and just simply cut and paste it into a tool like ChatGPT and say, please synthesize the following the top four qualities that were positive in professional development and the, the, the four qualities that teachers want to see the most professional development improvement in. And it will synthesize that. So it will take dozens of pages of comments and turn it into a really nice summary based on the data that was fed to it. So that saves time because we don't have to read every single comment. Of course, you have to go back and you have to make sure this goes back to the human element always use the human element. But the reality is it does something much faster, much more efficiently than we would be able to do ourselves. And this is a tool that should be used to expedite things. Um, most letters that I send out to my community, I will have ChatGPT do an initial draft because it's always easier to do, um, to work off of a draft than to work off of like starting from zero. Um, especially on something that has to be timely. So if you're in a crisis situation and you need to get information out to the community quickly about a fire that happened or something that, that transpired in your school or, or why there's an early dismissal, it will do a summary letter very quickly and then simply go in and make the adjustments that are necessary and you have more confidence sending it out once you, once you can do that. And it, it, it takes half the time that it traditionally would have taken. And just to, I just want to emphasize that a lot of those things are time consuming for a superintendent writing. Oh, look, I, I do some writing. Yeah. The first draft is the longest one. Yeah. <laughs> After you do the first draft, you're just, you know, you, you're wordsmithing at that point. Mm -hmm. Maybe something new comes up, but that's the hardest part. So what we're trying to do is take that thing that's time consuming and not, and you talked about synthesizing surveys, no matter what, those are time consuming. If you were doing yeah. it on your own, you would, it would take, hours. Definitely. There have been letters where you have to also be really careful, or you can also feed a letter in and say, hey, proofread this for all spelling, grammar. It will actually do that as well. Or I've also used it, for example, the health standards were very controversial not too long ago, a year ago. Um, and I have two large populations in my community that don't speak English as a primary language. They speak Hebrew and Korean. I actually used um, AI to translate the health standards and the opt-out forms for health standards into those languages as well. So it creates um, a tool that's very reliable, very efficient, and it's very multimodal. You can use it to do a lot of different things. And literally, we're just touching the surface right now as administrators about how this can make our lives easier. 
Um, let's get to, uh, is there any concern we touch on, any concern that we haven't touched on yet that you think you would, uh, you know, board should be aware of? Maybe a good question they should be asking their administration when they make proposals on AI. I would say one of the concerns will be that some people will have misinformation about AI detectors and how reliable they are. So if you are seeing cases come forward about plagiarism and you're saying, well, we're using an AI detector and it's saying it's plagiarized, that's a big concern that I would have. I think that before you create policies around plagiarism, you really have to go down the avenue of we, we don't have tools that can definitively say whether things are plagiarized or not right now, because we don't. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned the word policy. That's where a board's role is. Um, and I know your district, Verona, and, and I believe um, home that somewhere in Monmouth County also has a okay uh, AI policy. What are some of the things that are in the policy? You know, and if people want it, I, they can ask yeah. me, and I'll send it to them. I have the link, or they could go to your website to get it. They're always welcome to come to our website. Cresco has a policy. I don't remember the number, but you can go on our website and and look for it. Um, I went to Texpo not long ago and the speaker was talking about the importance of the policy and it was literally only me that had my hand up. Um, so it's something that's work that needs to be done. I think these are the elements that you need to have in the actual policy. You need to talk about your philosophy of AI as a tool and how it can be used and should be used and how it shouldn't be used. And it should also include some guidance to teachers about how they should address when they think it's being misused, right? Um, and then finally, I think that it, it should have an educational component for the teacher to discuss with the students the appropriate ways it should and should not be used as an expectation. So those are kind of the elements that I would see as being critical in a policy. Um, I think that those those will address most of the issues because what what is the policy going to do it's going to give guidance to your teachers about the, how they can and can't use the the tool with the students it's going to give um, repercussions to the teachers if students are misusing it and it also gives the teachers something to stand behind in terms of how they handle any of those those disagreements because you may have disagreements between parents who who are upset that their kid is being labeled as misusing a tool. And really the policy should prevent a lot of that. All right, uh, obviously you're a proponent of yeah. incorporating it. And, and, uh, but I think it's important to have that discussion. Um, as we move forward, what was some of the reaction from either staff or board members? Were they all over the place uh, in terms of some people are like, Thank God someone's talking about this is like, mm -hmm. or Peter's crazy, which I've heard. <laughs> well, it could be that. <laughs> uh, I think that um, initially, I think they're they're basically appreciative because they see it. They see the need for it. And they, they appreciate the fact that we're actually having a discussion about it. Um, I have to give give props to my, my colleague over in Verona, um, Diane Di Giuseppe, who kind of came with the first draft. Um, she and I then worked on it. I, I modified mine to, to, to be ours for Crestgill. But the reality is, um, if you're not addressing these things proactively, you will address them reactively. Yeah. And if you're addressing them reactively, it's going to frustrate everyone. Why not get ahead of it? Why not get ahead of it and think through some of these difficulties and put into place some things that protect your staff? So it doesn't have to be an argument. It doesn't have to be um, a headache later. And, you know, make sure it's tool agnostic. There's different types of, of AI that exist. Write your policy so that it only, that it incorporates any of them, right? So that's just my recommendation. All right, I'd like to thank you for joining me oh. on this. Uh, I think we just touched the iceberg of this discussion. Uh, I also would say that's something that you you may have a policy, but it's, it's a changing field. It really so is. So our yep. conversation a year from now may be totally different. You may have better recommendations. You may say, you know, mm -hmm. don't listen to what I said a year ago. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank Peter Hughes for joining me in this. I hope you enjoyed the discussion on AI, and I think at your board meetings you should start thinking about that, or maybe creating a 
committee that looks at it. So I hope you enjoyed it. And um, if you need it, his policy, go to the Crest Hill School District website.